All right, folks. Uh, welcome again, CC four twenty one. We are starting a new module, and this module is sort of, in some ways, a continuation of what we've been doing. Sort of looking at interrupted flow in the in the urban environment, urban suburban type environment where you have uh, where you have a lot of uh, sort of you know traffic of different kind and intersections and and not interchanges. And it's a continuation in that way that we are sort of like, you know, almost discussing an alternative to, you know, we are discussing an alternative to uh, the, <clears throat> the signalized intersection or, or a two-way stop control intersection, which would be a roundabout. But we are going to focus a little bit and, and it's a little bit of a different place because now we're not dealing as much with uh, you know, obviously we won't have to deal with signal timing and stuff, but we didn't do a whole lot of sort of highway capacity manual work in our, in our uh, you know, signalized intersection uh, analysis. And highway capacity manual, you know, we didn't do it partly because there is so much, so many concepts to learn within signalization that then doing the capacity analysis through a process of highway capacity manual would have been sort of too much. So we are sort of starting to build on the highway capacity, towards the highway capacity manual in some ways. So we didn't do a whole lot of it in our signalized intersection or unsignalized intersection analysis. Now that we're gonna talk about roundabouts, we are gonna do at least dabble into some of the concepts related to highway capacity manual. And then once we get to the point of where, you know, where we are now looking at, uh, uh, where we're now looking at sort of, you know, <clears throat> interrupted flow, when we start looking at uninterrupted flow, I'm sorry, uh, you know, the freeways and all of that, then we're going to dig fairly deep into highway capacity manual because the purpose is to give you at least some exposure on how to do step-by-step -step work from the highway capacity manual. Here, we're going to pick up some concepts, but we're not going to look at step-by-step -step of roundabout capacity analysis. We'll just talk about some concepts for now. And then, you know, we will, once we have that, um, uh, once we have that sort of background a little bit, we're going to switch over to uninterrupted flow on freeways and, and all of that. So that's going to be your module three, dabbling into roundabout, sort of building up and sort of uh, a replacement for intersect signalized intersection or a two-way stop control intersection. And then, uh, and then basically moving on to uninterrupted flow for freeways and do a full step-by-step uh, -step analysis. And you've done some of that in 321, but we're going to do a little bit more complicated. I think the most complicated stuff that we'll deal with is going to be uh, sort of weaving segment analysis where, you know, there's a pretty complicated set of movements that happen and all of that. Okay, so we're going to start off with roundabouts in this module three. It's not going to be part of your test on Tuesday. Oh, and speaking of test, I will have some extra office hours on Monday from uh, 3.10 to 4 o'clock. So... Monday, so if you want to stop by for any questions, 3.10 to 4 p.m., because I know tomorrow is a holiday. Um, so, and once you come back from, and then uh, if you want to make another appointment with me, you could do that via the calendar link that are provided in the syllabus. So feel free to set up if this time doesn't work for you. And then obviously I'll have the regular office hours on Tuesday, which is uh, 1.10 to 3 p.m., which is fine, but you know, maybe at, by that point, I I hope you will be well prepared and you know, not not needing as much assistance. But you're welcome to stop by for any last minute questions that you might have. Okay, so that's your Tuesday. So these are extra office hours. I mean, not extra. This is an extra office hour. So the office hours that are coming up. Again, today's material will not be in the test. It'll be based on uh, your your second um, <clears throat> uh, second module the homework, the problem set that you're working on. In terms of a couple of things about sort of how the test is gonna work, very similar to test one, maybe a little bit longer, maybe I, I gave you too much time the other day. Uh, <clears throat> so maybe a little bit longer than that, but, uh, and you can see sort of, you know, we're building up the content a little bit, so there is gonna be more to test on. Um, you might have noticed this, you might have picked up on it, but uh, so in the homework, I give you some, problems where you have to make assumptions 
where it's not entirely clear, you know, what you're supposed to do. For example, you know, when we are talking about the dilemma zone problem, there is a choice that you have to make, you know, how fast would you accelerate when you're trying to run the yellow and cross over the intersection. In the test, I will try to minimize those, those types of assumption making. I will try to put out as much information as I can. So you're not sort of struggling. But again, you know, it doesn't guarantee it, partly because, you know, I might do it on purpose, but partly because I might miss something too. So if you ever find yourself in a situation, I think your best bet is to kind of at least have some idea about what's a reasonable assumption, would, what is a reasonable assumption for that scenario, write it down clearly, and then move on and not sort of get bogged down in it. I will try to, as I said, I will minimize those types of things in the test environment because you don't have enough time to think about all those things. But if it does happen, you're supposed to not spend too much time, just come up with an assumption and just go on and move on with it. And again, we'll have some sort of true, false, short answer type questions. Um, and then we'll have some questions related to, um, well, you know, some problems just like you're seeing in your problem set too. Okay, uh, any questions or anything uh, about the test? You know, again, you're welcome to Bing for one, uh, one letter size page, front and back, whatever you want to write on it, you're welcome to do so. Uh, so you, you, any formulas, any examples, but if you need any tables, I will provide those. Yes. Are we allowed like the chapter 17 and chapter 20 packets? I, I would say just write down the formulas from that, okay. right? I think, I, but you don't have to write down the, uh, yeah, I think that's enough. Like you don't need, you don't need to bring in the whole packet. Uh, but whatever formula sheet, so, so I will just say, you know, one letter size page will be enough. Write down formulas, but don't write down, you know, adjustment factors and things like that. If you need it, I will give it to you. Okay, I, I might give you a bigger table than what you need, but you will have to sort of sort it out and figure out which number you want to use from that table. Okay, so no need to write down the tables. No need for tables. Formulas, concepts, I think those will be good to have. Like, for example, you definitely want to write down the C desirable formula and uh, and things like that. And then headway to saturation flow rate. Basically, whatever formulas you're using in the homework, if you can write down those, and they're not a lot of formulas. So you should be, you should be in good shape. But uh, any other questions about the about the test that's coming up on Tuesday? Yes, whatever you want. You want to write full examples, you're welcome to it. Um, you know, whatever you want, one page, the one letter size page, front and back, whatever you want. In any font that you want, presumably, presumably you want to be able to read it, but other than that, you know, that's your limiting principle there. Okay, so, <clears throat> you know, roundabouts are sort of an exciting topic in, in some ways, and partly because they're exciting, and partly why they're exciting is because they sort of combine you know, art and science. I got this from uh, a while ago, though. Uh, got this from one of the sort of Indiana DOT people. And a little piece of trivia for you. Carmel, Indiana is sort of known as the roundabout capital of the United States. There are so many roundabouts, but particularly why they have so many roundabouts. The reason is that, you know, that their mayor loves roundabout, basically. And, and um, you know, that's that's just how a lot of transportation decisions get made. You know, if you can convince some leader of the community to be behind that somehow and they don't lose election over it. Yeah, you got you got you can get a lot of things through. Uh, uh, so as long as that happens. So but it's exciting to me because, you know, roundabout is you know artist. Uh, you know, there is a lot of art to it, but then obviously there is engineering to it as well. So it roundabout sort of combines both of those things and and i have the dictionary definition of of those things but um, it won't be on the test or anything uh, but the idea is that in in signals in traffic signals and in uh, even in stop signs right you're basically allocating right of way but this roundabouts are sort of yield on entry and what everybody wants to yield at is, is different. And I, you probably did a lab. I know you did a lab on 
So looking at the behavior of the drivers, you know, uh, what sort of things can, you know, what type of gaps drivers accept versus what types of gap they reject, things like that. And we can come up with what we call a critical headway that's accepted by a by 50% of the drivers, but rejected by other 50% of the drivers, right? So there is sort of these ideas where you're leaving a lot on the behavior. And then this is something very interesting. You know, usually highway capacity manual doesn't do that, but one of the things that they say right on the HCM6 and also in HCM7, by the way, so highway capacity manual has a, uh, um, the current version is HCM7 that recently came out, like maybe a few months ago even. Uh, but the roundabout chapter is identical between HCM6 and HCM7. But anyway, they they specifically say that the roundabout, roundabout capacity in the US is lower than what they observe in other countries because the drivers sort of hesitate a little bit more as they're navigating through the roundabouts. And, and that's why a lot of drivers actually do not like roundabout especially when it first gets to their community. But once people get used to it, it's it's fantastic. It works really well. And, and then you could sort of extrapolate that information is that, you know, if there is a community that hasn't had a roundabout yet, they're going to build one. I just saw a news today. They're going to build one in Avila Beach, uh, right as you exit the, exit the US 101 freeway. Um, <clears throat> and which is, which is, Fantastic, I think in some ways, but if you sort of go out and measure the capacity of that roundabout, once it goes into place, you'll find that the capacity would be lower than a place like Carmel, Indiana, for example, where, uh, you know, capacity meaning like how many cars can be pushed through that roundabout, it would probably work out to be lower than, um, you know, what, uh, this capacity obviously depends on the behavior quite a bit, right? Like what's your critical gap, how much you're able to, and then we'll do some formula based work as well. So. Uh, so that's that. <clears throat> so when we talk about, and this is something that you might want to deal with as an engineer, and, and I deal with that quite a bit because, you know, sometimes there would be some media that's interested in roundabout. Suddenly, uh, one of our professors, uh, Dr. Uh, past professors, uh, Dr. Amir Molan, who moved to University of Mississippi, he was actually interviewed by NBC News, the, the national broadcast, about roundabouts. You know, round, NBC News did a quick segment, although I don't think he... His snippet was in the newsreel that they ran for like 40 seconds or whatever in the, in the, in the TV. But he was interviewed. And then that's a question that comes up quite a bit is what exactly is a modern roundabout, right? So modern roundabout is it's not a rotary, right? It's not a, a location like that. This is almost like merging onto a freeway. We don't have that. You know, basically the, the merging cars are provided here, like, you know, sort of their own lane a little bit. You could see almost there is a lot of extra space for for drivers to merge in and then they get into that second lane and then you could and then you could merge on to the highway so that the main circulating roadway so this is almost like the analysis of a rotary what what this is it may be almost like a weaving segment there's going to be a lot of weaving flows that are going to be coming in and out it's not a sort of a modern roundabout that has traditional yield on entry okay so that's that's what's called a rotary um these are what are these these are sort of more uh, your your neighborhood traffic circles okay so why are they not roundabouts because they don't have yield on entry they're supposed you know they're stop signs but they have a central island to kind of avoid those t-bone type crashes a little bit okay so that's another thing to think about there is that these <clears throat> because of the stop sign these traffic circles are not roundabout. They're neighborhood traffic circles are what they are. And you see so some of these in, in San Luis Obispo too. Uh, I'm trying to think when you're getting into downtown from Broad Street, one of those streets has a several of these uh, where you have sort of stop signs and then neighborhood traffic circles. I think it's probably Choro Street, is that? Uh, Patricia has some, yeah. Patricia has some as well. Uh, Patricia Drive uh, near Highland Drive up on um, Foothill Boulevard. Uh, so between Highland and Foothill, I know Patricia has that. They, those are very recently installed. I used to live there. They weren't there back then. But I think these are like, you know, maybe installations that came up within. So, but these are becoming pretty popular. But again, they're not roundabouts. Okay? Um, they have their uses, but they're not roundabouts. So 
let's let's talk a little bit about the pedestrians and bicyclists considerations. Uh, obviously, intersections have issues with uh, circles and roundabouts. If you and we you must have seen this diagram uh, at some point, maybe in an ITE meeting or anything like that. But what this diagram is doing is charting out all the conflict points at an intersection. And here, only the pedestrian conflict points are highlighted, right? So here, uh, the red dots are your pedestrian conflict points, but you could also see the problem with a traditional four-legged intersection in how many conflict points it has, right? And you could see there is conflict point here, it's conflict point here, it's conflict point here. So all these conflict points, are potentially a collision point, right? And some of these collisions could happen at pretty high speed if it's like a, uh, you know, if it's a signalized intersection and somebody runs the red light, it's a pretty, could be a pretty risky situation. And a lot of these conflicts, right? There is like potential for T-bone type crashes, uh, potential for left turn head-on type crashes. You know, some of these crashes are obviously merging crashes. So, so maybe not as severe, um, especially those involving right turns. But you could start to see like, you know, uh, here, the pedestrians have a potential for conflicting with three different types of movements, right? Here, there's one, one more movement here, you know, once you're, once you're crossing this point. So you could see that. But if you look at roundabout, this is what that looks like. So <clears throat> here, when pedestrian is on a crosswalk, you know, pedestrian has to watch for and then they may or may not have these refuge islands, right? So some intersections do have these refuge islands here, but a lot of them don't. And, you know, if they don't have it, as a pedestrian, when you're crossing it, you have to take care of both directions of traffic. You have to be aware of both directions of traffic, making sure nobody's coming. Signalized intersection would minimize that, right? Because, you know, we've seen the warrants and all that. So once you put in the signal, you'll minimize those conflicts but you still have to be aware of it as a pedestrian if somebody's running the red light and whatnot. And the other thing about this is that a lot of these intersections where pedestrian crossings are happening may not be signalized at all, right? They might be two-way stop control or, or four-way stop control or whatever, right? So then you're ending up with these conflicts, but look at roundabouts. Roundabouts have, you know, they almost always have this, this splitter island, right? So they always have this. And because they always have this, because roundabouts will always have this type of splitter, you know, that splits the roadway. There is always, anytime you are getting into a danger zone as a pedestrian, you only have to watch one way. Vehicular traffic can only come from one direction. I think that that also is a, somewhat of an attractive uh, proposition for the pedestrian. Okay. Now, the other thing about this is that, you know, that roundabouts have what we call the yield on entry. And so that's a modern roundabout also. So, so these are some of the characteristics of modern order. The splitter island, the yield on entry, and then this deflection that, you, that the drivers have to make as they approach the roundabout. They, they, because of that deflection, the speed goes down. So this lower speed and the ability to cross the road by looking only on one side can potentially offer benefits to pedestrians. Okay, so something to keep in mind as you as you sort of look at roundabout versus versus a traditional four-legged intersection with a stop sign or whatever. So not only is it minimizing the conflict points, it's also sort of making the task of the pedestrians a little bit easier, in that they only have to look at one side. But if you look at some of the research there. You you would find that there is not necessarily a safety concern, but some 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 of the accessibility related concerns, and and highway capacity manual mentioned some some research, some ideas that have gone into uh, into thinking about what we can do about this. Is that you can see on signalized intersection, we have pretty established practice of providing push buttons and and maybe some voice signals, um, some. Uh, some visual, not not just visual cues, but some cues related to that. The, uh, uh, some cues that, a, excuse me, a visually impaired person can also rely on. Our initial roundabouts that we installed in this country did not have that. 
But I think in most modern roundabouts, now we are starting to do that. In fact, there have been some roundabouts where they're, they're looking at those push buttons where pedestrians, like especially uh, who have accessibility needs, can actually stop traffic if they need to. So some of these modern stop, you know, if you if you absolutely have a need there, those things could be accommodated. Yes. But like having like the flashing LED. Yeah, something like some something along those lines, where the vehicular traffic knows that an individual who needs, uh, you know, who has a visual impairment is actually crossing the roundabout. So there are some. Uh, you know, some of the th these things are starting to happen for accessibility. And again, this is not necessarily a safety issue because I think single line intersections are not as safe uh, as roundabout for even for pedestrians. But that that is uh, something to think about uh, for pedestrians that have other needs. Okay. So, so if you look at the most recent research, there is uh, vision disabilities is a big concern at roundabouts right now. So if you're installing one, if you're thinking of installing one, you have to be, um, I guess we already talked about this. Um, bicycle consideration, you know, and this is one thing that has been an issue, I think, because bicyclists, obviously, bicycles cannot have a bike lane. Bike lanes are not recommended on the, on the roundabouts. And because bike lanes are not recommended on the roundabouts, you know, you're mixing with traffic mixing bicyclists with other uh, vehicular traffic, uh, automobile traffic, even truck traffic, all of that. So there is actually some, some concerns with bicycle safety on roundabouts, right? So, so that is somewhat of an issue. But again, slower speeds on approach to roundabouts is helpful there. And the other thing that the bicyclists have an option for, if they do not feel safe, they have to. They have the option of behaving like the pedestrian, right? So what they can do is they can actually use the crosswalks and use those advantages, as you can see on this bottom picture right here. So if you if you look at this, one second here. Yeah. So so you could look at this picture and see if they they are using the crosswalk, and you could use the crosswalk while riding, and that's fine. Uh, that's perfectly allowed. Or you could do this if you don't see any conflicting traffic or merging traffic into the roundabout. So bicyclists does do have some safety issues, but I think having this option of behaving like a pedestrian probably addresses that problem a little bit more. Do uh, you have a question, right? Yeah, I was trying to say, isn't there that approach where just make the next crossing just like the multi-use bike, multi-use like multi-modal path? And path it is. Yeah, it, it basically functions as that. Yes, you're right. So so this pedestrian crossing, you're allowed as a bicyclist to ride that path. Uh, obviously, you want to be careful and all that, but you know, yeah. So you could, you could, yeah, this, that is exactly how the crossing would function as a multi-use path. But again, you have to be careful about the crossing. Uh, yes, please. Basically, a bike lane does not have to be approached. Yeah, so... Uh, like uh, no, I think what they what they do nowadays, like if you have a bicycle lane, that goes into so you typically what will happen is that for example, if you have the path like this and you had a bike lane upstream of it, the bike lane merges into this pedestrian walkway. You you see that a lot of San Luis Obispo roundabout. Uh, if you go to for example Tank Farm and Orchid uh, uh, you know location, uh, there are you know there are actually on Tank Farm there are two roundabouts now. So tank farm and orchid roundabout, that's exactly what happens. You have a bike lane coming in. It merges with this pedestrian path. You can get on it pretty easy, uh, pretty pretty painless. And then it sort of, and then if you want to turn right, then you can merge back onto it. Uh, if, you're, if you're going through, then you could sort of cross it and then make a left. I think the through is just going to a park. So you just uh, at the park at that point. Uh, but yeah, so, so what they do is like they merge it with the pedestrian path for the most part. That's how uh, those things work. So let's see. Uh, and again, for, for bicyclists, again, if they, they behave like pedestrians, uh, by, by, you know, <clears throat> so this is, uh, so this, this, 
So because bike lanes are not re uh, cyclists merge with traffic before entering. So, and you know, bicyclist has, as I said, you know, there are two options, right? They can, I mean, this, this picture is sort of moved up and um, it's, sort of, you know, it's kind of funky little picture here. But the idea is that, you know, bicyclists can either merge with the traffic or they can do this. They could, you know, they could come in like this, as I was saying. But, you know, even if there is a bike lane that merges onto it, please note that it doesn't prohibit bicyclists from entering the roundabout. There's no prohibition. Bicyclists can, in fact, enter the roundabout as, as they would choose, as they would, as a vehicular traffic or as an automobile traffic would go. So even if there is a option for bicyclists, as I was talking about, like, you know, they can, in fact, merge into the roundabout. And then highway capacity manual recommends that if you, I thought there was something else here too. Anyway, so if you if you do have a bicyclist entering the, if you do have a bicyclist sort of going into traffic into into the circulatory traffic within roundabout, there is an, you know, we talked a lot about through vehicle units and things like that. So there is actually a, a highway capacity manual recommended value that you could use so that the ET value, or no. I guess you would call it EB value, right? Equivalent, uh, how many cars is one bicyclist equal to? They recommend an EB value of 0 0.5. Okay, so they recommend if bicycle does indeed does, does indeed take this path where they merge onto the traffic. And again, this is kind of funky here. This is what I'm trying to show is that, you know, it actually is merging with the traffic, merging with the car traffic. So this is, this should be shifted by a little bit. And I'll try to see if I can, uh, I can, maybe I can move it. I should probably be doing this. Yeah, so I, I'll try to get this fixed. But the idea is that if, you, if they do merge it like this on the traffic, your EB value, the equivalent value of each bicycle, yeah, so the passenger car equivalent factor of 0 0.5. So, so this is what the passenger car equivalent factor of 0 0.5 is what is recommended for you to use. So whenever you're making calculations such as uh, you know, which you will make in, in, in just a second, um, you know, uh, because you'll have some estimates to make for entering volume, exiting volume, all of that, circulating volume, all of that would, would have to be made. And you will you will make that, you'll make that with a EV value of 0 0.5. So just remember that. There would be a speed differential, but again, the idea is that you know. Roundabout circulation speed should be boiling down to 15 to 20 miles an hour, even for car traffic. And the bicyclist could potentially maintain that. But yeah, no, I think that that's absolutely right. Uh, so that was basically the problem with why, you know, you, you'll find some literature actually that bicyclists have an issue with bike lanes. And, and I was doing some research in, uh, in sort of mixed heterogeneous traffic. I think this was in India and they were looking at roundabout so one type of traffic that actually experienced increased severe conflicts that could lead to collision. We didn't look at the whole, uh, you know a long-term crash data or anything for that study, but we were just measuring how many potential conflicts between bicyclist traffic and uh, automobile traffic occurs. Bicyclist-related conflicts were the only one that went up with a roundabout compared to a four-legged intersection. So that was that was sort of interesting. Uh, as well. So, but again, you know, because the bicyclist has this option of riding with traffic, uh, can choose to travel as a pedestrian, I think this should take care of a lot of the safety concerns. That would be, uh, you know, my recommendation. <clears throat> okay. So, round out capacity, the key concepts. So, there are three sort of three key values that we are interested in and what the capacity depends on. And this is directly from the highway capacity manual. The VC value, the VE value, and the EX value. So VC value is the circulating traffic. Okay. VE value is the entering traffic, entering volume. And VEX means the exiting volume. Okay. So if you look at any roundabout approach, you can do the capacity analysis. You need to know these three things. Entering volumes, 
circulating volume and the exit volume. And remember, circulating volume would change for each approach too, right? Because, because obviously, this entering volume will encounter circul circulatory volume that excludes these guys, right? Now, this volume here, like if you kind of extrapolate that this, there was an, another entering volume here. So when you're doing capacity analysis for this approach, the circulating volume would be including this, these traffic, including the VE from the previous approach, but excluding the VEX from this approach. Okay? So just be careful about, you know, whenever we're doing capacity analysis, we have to think about uh, these three volumes for each approach. The capacity of a roundabout depends on what approach you're dealing with. Okay. Roundabouts, you know, when can you use them? I think you can use them in a lot of situations. One place where, you know, they could be, they could be somewhat problematic is that when you have really, really high volume, especially really, really high left turning volume, they could be, they could be problematic. Okay. It's because, you know, then, then you, what you have is, really high left turn volume from all approaches, then your circulating volume might become too high because there's not enough exit that happens on e these right turns. As vehicles enter, they all circulate all the way here. And these guys that are entering from this volume, they will circulate all the way here. So for some of the approaches, the total circulating volumes could be pretty high. It could cause some problems, right? So, so we have very high left turn volumes from all approaches, potentially could be a, could be a problem for roundabouts. And, and obviously, if you have sort of, you know, a mix of traffic signals that are coordinated together, then you probably don't want to put a roundabout there because, again, this might uh, this might um, sort of mess up things because the drivers will slow down and you're, you're uh, as the roundabouts as they should. And, and your question will become like, you know, if that speed would be enough for you to maintain that green light, green wave progression, all of that stuff. Yes. Can you know if this do like well about that case you just replace the entire corridor and add about Intra I would love that to happen, right? So so basically they are talking about that on uh I know like the city of Henson did did that on their report. Oh, so was that used did that used to be sort of coordinated signals? Yeah, they yeah. it all roundabout. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think roundabouts are great because I think one thing that people sort of get pretty hung up on, and this was something I want to talk about. Uh, I did a little podcast recording. For uh, for KCBX a while ago, and this was some of the one of the questions. And this was the topic was pretty hot because the Country Club crowd was pretty opposed to the Country Club crowd at the you know the San Luis Obispo Country Club over there uh, over um, after the airport south of the airport. Uh, and the question that they had was that you know they were worried that they will not be able to make the right turn or the left turn if there is no signal upstream. Because their, their contention was that right now they can sometimes make that right turn coming out of the country club. So, so just I think this might be helpful to have uh, the map up here. If you look at this map here. But I, have, I have all these YouTube tabs open, but I wasn't watching videos. I was just posting that. I was posting your class videos that I hadn't posted. So all of your old class videos now should be available, except for one that I, where I forgot to record. So, so if you look at this broad street, right? So they want to replace the broad street with a couple of roundabouts uh, on broad streets going from the airport and all that. So the folks that come out of this, this intersection here, and this is where the country club is. So this is the, the San Luis country club. Uh, and there is a school and all that. But... Folks were pretty opposed to it because their contention was that coming out of Los Ranchos Road, they can only make the right turn here because the signal provides adequate gaps to them coming out. So when the, this signal is red, uh, Crestbone Drive, I don't think is a signal, but I think when well, Buckley Road is a signal. Yeah, yeah, Buckley Road is a signal. So they, they, their contention was they can only turn right on their, uh, you know, on to Broad Street on that 227 when the light is red on the Buckley Road. And, and that's a reasonable point in some ways, you know, because if the traffic keeps coming in at that speed, they would probably have that, have that issue. But if your last signal 
So a couple of things about that, right? The way the traffic moves. If your last signal is actually going to be, I think they were talking about last signal be at the airport. So, so arrow drive would have been the last signal at that point. Or I don't think they were going to talk about air, replacing arrow road with a roundabout. I don't think so. But if arrow road was your right left signal, your distance between the arrow drive signal and this roundabout would have been pretty large, plenty large enough to break up the platoons that come in, right? So then your traffic actually wouldn't move into a platoon in the first place. So you would have higher number of gaps anyway, because your last signal is so far upstream that it's like, you know, even when a lot of vehicles sort of come together after the light turns green, they will come together at the beginning. But vehicle does, the traffic does sort of platoon itself uh, you know, in a, into a bunch of different, uh, you know, platoons. The platoons do get broken up if the signal is that far upstream. So that's one thing. And the other thing is that if you're talking about a roundabout, it forces drivers to slow down and it does, right? Because of the deflection angle. And at that slightly slower speed, your gap requirements are not as high, right? So, so their opposition was based on something that they have observed right now, but again, once that gets replaced roundabout, situation would in fact be different than what they're observing right now. Right? So, so that's something that, I mean, I think they blocked it for a while, but I think because it's a Caltrans facility, ultimately Caltrans is in fact going to, going to build it. So it's going to get built anyway. So, but you know, uh, people with times on, time on their hand can actually block things, but, but then ultimately we'll, we'll see what happens. But they will, what's that? Yes. I think there is. I think this one is planned out. I think this is. I think there is enough space there. They might have to. Ah, uh, no. I think there is because I think there is enough space because there is a lot of space here. Um, you know, one day I made a mistake of taking my my daughter to her school in the bike, and yeah, man, that was dangerous. Uh, I did not do that. Make that mistake again. Uh, but uh, but yeah. So I think that. But there is enough space on this side. I think this side might be might be more problematic. But I think there is enough space on this side that they might be able to do something with it. Yeah. So again, the traffic sort of moves um, <clears throat> differently once you have a different arrangement. I think there is there is a lot of land here that they can they can work with. I think. Uh, but anyway. So. <clears throat> and then, uh, in terms of signalized intersection, one of the key things that we noticed that popped up again and again when we were doing timing when you're thinking about signalized intersection capacity was the saturation headway, right? Saturation headway was if the light always turned green, right? If, if the light will always remain green, at what rate vehicles could go, right? Now, there is an equivalent concept. That's not exactly the same concept, I wouldn't say, but there is an equivalent concept of what we call the follow-up headway, okay? Of, of the follow-up headway that gets applied when you're talking about roundabout and not just roundabout, pretty much any yield, not just even, in fact, in yield even, even on two-way stop control intersection. So anytime where there is a minor street traffic that has to merge with the major street where they're supposed to yield, either through a yield sign or with a full-blown stop sign, not blown stop sign, full, full stop sign, right? In those types of situations, there is a concept called follow-up headway. So what is that follow-up headway? The follow-up headway is this idea of if the gap on the main street, for, for example, in the roundabout, that would be circulating traffic would provide that. That would be the main street that's your mainstream that you're supposed to yield to. If this circulating traffic always had enough gap, right? What gap these merging vehicles accept between each other? Right? So that's your follow-up headway. If there is large enough gap between two consecutive vehicles that are on the mainstream that you're supposed to yield to, what is the gap that these merging vehicles accept between each other? So that's your follow-up headway. Okay? And then obviously there is what we call a critical gap. That's also critical to uh, the analysis. And then and I already mentioned today what, what that critical gap looks like. So there are two concepts here, uh, critical headway, and then follow up headway. And so I talked about follow up headway. And then I hope you're able to see why 
follow up headway is analogous to 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 saturation headway does that does that make sense to you why is because saturation headway is basically if the light always turned green what headway would you accept and on because again we said like you know we have determined the roundabout capacity by approach if there was enough gap available all the time what gap would you accept while merging what follow up headway would you accept while merging right so i hope you see the analogy between the two things for signalized intersection and for for follow up roundabout because again okay so and then critical headway critical headway i already mentioned it's the headway that will be rejected by 50% of the drivers and accepted by 50% of the drivers right so it's kind of a median headway that half the people would accept and half the people would reject okay so that's that's uh, another thing that you have to be uh, concerned about so those are sort of so these three volume concepts and then the critical headway um, and the follow up headway these are the a very important capacity concept that our highway capacity man would talk about let's see if I can talk a little bit about some formulas here. And now we are in the land of empirical formulas. Right? Once you once you get to the highway capacity manual, you are dealing with uh, uh, <clears throat> with the lane capacity. This is single lane roundabout. And you know, anytime you're talking about roundabout capacity, you have to be very careful about these two things. You're talking about capacity of a single entry lane conflicted by one circulating lane. So you have to be worried about two things here, right? One is how many lanes are entering the roundabout and how many lanes are circulating the roundabout. Okay? So a single lane roundabout, um, and then I basically this you can think of this as like you know this were one lane, so you could you could use this. Uh, is based on conflicting flow. The the equation is there. Couple of things about this circulating uh, capacity. CE, it's the capacity of the entry lane. Uh, in TCE, passenger car equivalents. PCE stands for passenger cars per hour. PC stands for passenger car equivalent. So I'll write that down here. PCE is passenger car equivalent. And then uh, uh, we talked about that already. And then E is that exponent, like, you know, so, and then you could just enter it in calculator. So you can see that this only depends on conflicting flow rate. Okay. So conflicting flow rate, and then uh, you know you're able to to get the capacity of the entering lane, and obviously adjusted for heavy vehicles, adjusted for bicycle volume also. You know we talked about that 0.5. And you know, but the the thing that you have to remember though is that yeah, this formula works, but if you actually look at roundabout to roundabout, there is so much variation in the data. There's so much variation in the in the data that exists here. So let me let me see if I can quickly pull up my HCM six here. I just want to show you something else here. Supplemental result. There is a roundabout supplemental chapter. Again, this is from HCM6, but it works for, for all of them. And let me just quickly stop sharing share my entire screen here. If you look at this roundabout supplement chapter, one thing I did want to say here that yes, we have a formula, we can apply this formula. But one thing that you have to remember is, is this issue right here. Okay. One entry lane, one conflicting lane. You know, we use that sort of conflicting flow that you could observe. 
the entering fl flow that you could observe. And I know you're measuring capacity, but look at the variation here. And this is based on, they don't mention how many data points they have, but this is from the roundabout design guide. Uh, that's also developed based on the same research at CM fully depends on that. Uh, so this is from Kittleson, by the way, this, this, uh, this person and the team was from Kittleson, but you can see that, yeah, we can, we can fit a best fit, best fit curve, right? But look at the, look at the variation. It's all over the place. Pretty low R square. Yeah. Uh, pretty, pretty low R square. Yeah. So that's the problem. The bulk of this variation is attributed to driver behavior, truck percentage, and, and, uh, and exiting vehicles. Basically, driver driver interactions govern the operation, and they are highly variable by nature, right? Because now you're, uh, you know, now you're dealing with there's no signal to to assign right of way. There's no stop sign to assign right of way. You're supposed to yield to entry, and this is what this is what happens. So there is a large uh, so yeah so so you could you know come up with what I showed you that you can apply the formula that I showed you, you know here. But even when you apply the formula, you know, don't be surprised if you go out in the field and measure it, and you know, you might you might see different numbers, uh, you know, sort of line up because of that. And okay, now you could have a situation. Another equation here: capacity at real each entry lane conflicted by one circulating lane. Okay, so I'll, I'll try and show you both of these formulas. I'll write down on the board here. Okay, so I'll write down the formula for you. So let's try to annotate the long way. So let's do one thing here. What I want you to think about is So this is, but remember, this is capacity of each entry lane, first of all. So you have to make, make sure that you pay attention to this. This is the capacity. This is the capacity of each entry lane, uh, you know, conflicted by one circulating. So this is, this is what the roundabout looks like. The circulating lane typically would be wider, and that's fine, right? Uh, and then you have two lanes entering here. And you have uh, VC values, VE left and right. CE, PCE is 1420. And then this is the formula. And what I want you to do is, I want you to kind of come up with, uh, I'll give you a number for VC, uh, a VC value. So let's later use the VC value of 1000. So let's use the VC value of 1000. And let's come up with some capacity values. So the conflicting flow, no, 1,000 is probably too high. So let's look at VCE value of like, you know, maybe 900, 800. Let's, let's go with 800, okay? So let's go with 800. Let's assume VC value is equal to 800 in PCE. What is the capacity? So I want you to estimate the capacity of this situation. If the conflicting flow rate is 800 passenger cars per hour, Let's apply this formula and come up with an entering uh, lane capacity. Capacity of entry, but remember this is per lane. Okay, capacity of each entry lane conflicting by one. So let's use your calculators. Plug in VC is equal to 800 in this formula. See what you get. Take, take a couple of minutes. Uh, maybe run your number with your neighbor and then see what, see what you get. Oh, you can't see it? Is that a problem? Okay, let's see. You can... oh, yeah, I know it's tiny, but let's... No. Okay, do you see it now? 
Yeah, so there are two equations, remember? So this is the... Yeah, there is another one right before that, and that's basically for one lane entry and one lane circulating. I thought it was negative 0.9. Yeah, so probably this one. That's there is actually a third one too. We will talk about. It. Yeah, so that's the third one. We'll talk about that. That's a different one. What about the slide like right above? Okay, sorry. So let's see. So I want you to one lane entry conflicted by two circulating lanes. So let's go with just this one. This is the equation. Point eight five. Okay. Yes. So for like the two lane entries, one lane roundabout, would that be a two by one or a one by two? In what way? Like, you know. Like calling it like referring to a one by Because like they call like one by one, two by one, and one by two, and by two. Yeah. So I think this would basically depends on like, you know, what's your exit lanes on the other side look like. But yeah. So this is going to be based on entering lane uh, traffic. So it will be like, you know, two by whatever, you know, is happening. Yes. Wait, what's the two lane? So yeah, so two lane equation. So this is, so if you have a two lane conflicting by two circulating lanes, then right and left have two different. So this is one and one, right? Two lane and three. No, sorry. Uh, you know, the problem is, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is two lane entering one lane. So yeah, this is the formula. Let me let me start, try to see if I can maximize it so you could all see it. Yeah, yeah, so so remember that if there is only one conflicting lane, you can assume that the both entering lanes will have same capacity. Right? That makes sense because again, you are worried about the same traffic that's that's bothering you. Right? But if there are two lanes, then that that complicates things. Okay. So and let's look at the previous formula as well. And 800 is our value. I want you to think about like you know what's happening to the capacity as you add lanes. So this is 1380 e raised to power whatever. So this is one by one. So what I mean, one entry, one circulate. Again, I got these equations from HCM6. Good news is HCM7 is identical. And why it's a good news? Because I happen to have, uh, I do have a sort of a digital copy of HCM6, so which I can, at least part of that I can share with you. So what's the numbers? Let's let's look at some numbers. What, what did we get for the, uh, using 22.1, what did we get the numbers to be? Okay, did you get that? What's the capacity? Please, 1200? No. What did you get? Anybody? One by one is about six ten. Six ten. Yeah, that makes more sense. Six. Uh, six ten. Again, passenger cars per hour, right? Because that's our unit. Uh, <clears throat> okay. And then what did we get for the two lanes? On each lane. Six eighty five for each lane, right? So you got six eighty five passenger cars per hour for each lane. So again, you know, roundabouts are interesting because the problem will come, as you will see, when you run into multiple lane roundabouts. Right? This is this is pretty good, right? Like, you know, you're adding the lane, you have two lanes, and now your capacity, even per lane, is higher now. Right? It's higher than single lane coming in. Right? This, this is this is nice. Like you know, you're adding lane, and then you're getting more per lane capacity out of that roundabout, and and that's all to the good. Except, like let's let's take a look at what happens. We got this, and we got this right. We did this one. 
one lane round about with two capacity. Okay, so this is the last one. Yeah, let's get these values as well. So now let's think about a two lane roundabout. Now here, I hope you can all see that your two lane roundabout has a different capacity for left lane and a different capacity for right lane. And your roundabout looks something like this. Roundabout will look something like this. I'll give you the formula in a second, but, but let's first look at what the roundabout would actually look like. Right? So this is this is what that is. And, and roundabouts, you know, they're great, but you can't have, you know, once you get to two lanes circulating, but that's it, right? Pretty much. You don't want to have more than two lanes. You can't have more than two lanes sort of circulating. Yes. How about turbo roundabouts, which have three? So yeah, turbo, yeah. So turbo roundabouts basically what they do is like they they provide some treatment here that limits the internal lane changes. And that's how they can function. And turbo roundabouts are very, very recent concept. In fact, I have a research project that I'm working on with Caltrans on trying to see what would happen to safety and, and conflicts if you install a turbo roundabout uh, and it's a rural location, a lot of agriculture, a lot of truck traffic and all of that. Uh, but again, you know, you could have more range, but the, the idea of turbo roundabout is that you limit the number of changes inside, number of lane changes inside the roundabout. By providing some kind of a you know divider between lanes and all that, and and that's another sort of topic that that if you're interested, I'm happy to share some more content. But the idea of roundabout is that because you have so much leeway, you're giving to the drivers. Once you get to more than two lanes here, things start to you know, I wouldn't say fall apart necessarily, but get pretty problematic. Okay. So let's look at this formula here. Um, so left lane capacity and the right lane capacity. So if you have the same 800 passenger cars per hour circulating traffic, what happens to the right lane capacity and the left lane capacity? So okay. So let's figure out, do you have the numbers? for the right lane and the left lane capacity? Can you guys see these formulas at all? Numbers, anybody? So seven nineteen for the right lane. And for the left lane, you got 646, 647. Yeah, and you know, the, the thing about this is that, you know, you're conflicting. Yeah, so exactly. So, so now I'm saying like, you know, your 800 traffic in passenger cars is divided into two lanes. So you really only have, you know, if you kind of think about it that way, if they're dividing equally, they may not. But like maybe one lane has 400, like each lane only has 400 and 400. Or maybe each lane has, maybe there is an uneven split of 500 and 300, whatever it is, right? So you are basically dealing with this situation. And is this number, it's like what, 13, if you look at, add up these two numbers, 1366 and 685 and 685 is 1370, right? So. So yeah, you get pretty close to each other, but then if you have two less lanes, it does decrease the capacity by a tiny bit for the same. But but you think about this: each lane only has four hundred, but it's still decreasing the capacity, right? Because 
Now you're only watching for 400 vehicles on one of the lanes. Maybe right lane has 400, 500, definitely less than 800, right? Because at least some traffic is circulating on that left lane when you're trying to merge. But your capacity actually goes down a tiny bit compared to what was happening on a single lane circulation, right? So, so that that is basically behavioral stuff because people are not sure who's going to change lane. So sometimes they have a hard time accepting what type of gap to accept, what type of gap to reject, all that. So, so that does lead to some sort of interesting uh, questions regarding regarding capacity and so forth. So, so what I'm going to do is I will have a little bit more. I'm going to stop here today, but I will have a you know maybe few more pointers to hit on roundabout capacity. So there's some independent topics. We are not in fact going to do sort of a roundabout capacity analysis from the HCM chapter. I'm not going to go through step-by-step step of that. We'll do that for the weaving segments. So you have some experience of doing that. Uh, but I will talk about some interesting ideas about roundabout capacity and maybe you know what, what things you could do to improve the capacity and all of that that are sort of go beyond these formulas uh, in the next class a little bit. And then we'll talk about, you know, switch over to uh, uninterrupted flow on freeways and 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 two lane highways even a little bit and truck climbing and all that good stuff. So so that's basically it's going to be the the module for you. Uh, again, uh, note my office hours if you want to stop by there. If you have any questions, um, and then you know, giving you like a, maybe a few minutes extra, fifteen minutes extra for for your test prep. Yeah, and then that would be another thing if you have some questions about your homework or test or anything. Uh, you know, I can stick around for like next fifteen minutes or so. And happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have. But again, for your homework, reasonable assumptions, if you can make those and then go from there, um, that, that's fine. And then, you know, I'll, I'll, you'll get full points, but then look at your feedback carefully so that you, you know, you, you're successful in the exams. Okay. Any questions or anything? I'll be happy to answer those. Yes, please. I guess I would hear when you think that the chapters are the same as the PDF that you so the canvas PDF is basically the full full book. It's a it's a chapter of that, but yeah, I could I could probably I might have some extra copies here. So let's take a look at yeah. So if you were not here on any of the lectures, I usually print out for the whole class. So I I should have, and I never sort of arrange what happens inside my backpack until the end of the quarter. So everything should be in here, except for the test paper because I do have to take it's them out. The yeah, I mean. That's right. Okay, yeah, so you could actually go to that chapter, but it'll lighten the load on my backpack. So maybe, so chapter 17? Okay, so take that. All right. Anything else? Any questions?